Welcome to Inside Forbes with me, Sally Musa, as we take a look at the highlights of the latest edition of Forbes Middle East with our managing editor, Claudine Coletti. Claudine, it's great to have you. It's great to be here. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> This is fantastic. It is the March issue of Forbes Middle East, and this month we are revealing the top 100 Arab family businesses. We are, we are. Of out now, out of now. 2024. <laughs> but before we get into the list, Claudine, how important is it for these enduring family businesses to have that legacy? How big is that in terms of impact and value? In all honesty, I think it's much bigger than you probably realize. It's much bigger than I realized when I first came into this. Um, EY actually estimate, because it's not just this region, it's globally. So EY estimate that if the top 500 largest family businesses in the world was a national economy, it would be the third largest in the world behind US and China. I mean, that's, that's just, that's absolutely huge. And if you look at this region in particular, the UAE's Ministry of Economy estimated that about 90% of private companies in this country are owned by families, contributing like 40% to GDP, employing 70% of private sector workforce. I mean, they're hugely important. It just can't be overestimated. It's so important to get it right, you know, but as we know, succession from the TV series <laughs> is incredibly challenging from one generation to the next. But what do you think it is? that can really determine the kind of factors that would determine the success uh, of a company longer term and to have that kind of legacy? So first of all, I absolutely love that TV program. <laughs> <laughs> I do hope that in real life, uh, our family businesses are dealing with slightly less drama. Um, I don't know that there's really a solid blueprint. Um, there's obviously many, many factors that will determine how successful a family business is and how long it lasts for. I mean, the next generation have to want to be involved. Obviously, the founder, it's their vision, it's their dream, it's their baby. Um, you know, the second, third, fourth generation need to also want to be a part of that, and they might not necessarily. Um, we do see quite a few of the founders getting the next generation involved at very young ages. Um, so there are some stories of, like, kids being taken to the office on weekends and things like this. Um, and then, you know, once you're bringing in the next generation, I think one of the main things is having a shared vision. Because the new generation are going to want to, you know, make their own stamp. They're going to have their own ideas. Um, but the founders still at the top of the food chain, you know, they, they still want to make sure that their vision is being held true. Um, so there has to be a bit of a shared vision as new generations come in. And then one of the most important things, I think, is to have a really solid plan for transition. Um, and I mean, this should be in place long before a transition kind of happens. But you know, a real solid plan. So Saudi and the UAE actually both now have um, centers for family business where they actually work with family businesses to help them um, formulate those kind of legacy plans um, and help them through any potential, you know, any potential conflicts just to make sure that things continue to run smoothly because they are so important to the economies. Yeah. So actually one of the one of the stories that we feature, the al Qurayf group, um, they're actually formulating or strategizing a family pact now. We talk about that in the, in the story. Um, and the details of that should be coming out this year. But that's just one example of how they're kind of considering this as they move forward. You know, it's so interesting what you're talking about. There are so many factors to the success of these businesses. But someone who's really bucking the trend and reinventing the future is Caroline Fatal. She is the chairwoman of the 127-year-old Fatal group, which is just incredible. She's a fourth generation leader here. How rare is that? And what's behind the success of Fatal group? It's incredibly rare. It's incredibly rare. Um, it's, it's kind of well reported. I think only around 3% of family businesses make it to the fourth generation. Um, I think part of the success for the Fatal group and Caroline is that she was kind of brought in after having some experience outside of the family business. So she had 10 years before she came in and started working um, with, with her family. And I think that adds value. And I think family businesses do recognize the importance of having non-family members. Yeah, that, that is a big uh, key uh, as well for these businesses moving on and growing in ways that they may not have before as well. Mm -hmm. But women in leadership for these family businesses, 
that is, of course, not something that you see a lot of, right? It's not. Unfortunately, it's still quite rare. I mean, I think that's, that's a, unfortunately a standard statistic across the board. Women are still appearing to be quite underrepresented at the top. Um, I think it's important to remember the context, though. There are a lot of women involved in their family businesses in C-suite and managerial levels. They just don't happen to sit in that top seat because it's still held by the, fam by the founder or a, you know, a long-standing second-generation member. I think and I hope as time goes on, we're going to see more women in those top positions. But yeah, at the moment, it's fair to say it's still slightly rare. Caroline's feature is fascinating in the magazine. Absolutely love it. Uh, but let's also now take a look at the list itself. Mm -hmm. What is standing out for you in the top 100 family business list this year? I mean, what strikes me about the list is, is the diversity in it. I mean, it's not just the Fatal group. We have six entries that were that were formulated in the 1800s. And I just can't, it, that, it just astounds me, 1800s. Um, and then we have six that were established in the 2000s. Um, the overwhelming majority, I think over 75% of the list are GCC based, led by Saudi um, and followed by the UAE and Qatar and, and Kuwait. Um, but also it's the diversity of what they're now investing in. A lot of these holding groups, they're really seeing the value in clean energy and tech startups. Um, they're really starting to think about what the future looks like. It is really moving into these new sectors that we are seeing coming up now as well. But speaking of the most powerful companies, the, the, the richest uh, families <laughs> in the world, the world's richest man, Bernard Arnault, he's also tightening the reins as well. What kind of moves is he yeah. making to Rich. keep control? Yes, the, the richest person in the world, not just the richest man. Um, yeah. Well, I think he still is, might be Musk today. Who knows, he changes, <laughs> exactly. changes regularly. Um, he's basically ensuring that the family still remain um, essentially in control of the vision of the company. He has five children. Uh, four boys, one daughter. Two of them have been on the board for a while. He's now brought two more um, into into the fold of the board. There's one more still to come, but I think we can expect that in the future. He's just still a bit young at the moment. Um, so yeah, he's just making sure that the family, they, they all have managerial positions. Now four out of five also have board seats. Um, and we, we talk more about that. And so we kind of explore what it is that they're doing. But yeah. it's very interesting. It is absolutely fascinating to see. And what's also uh, fantastic is you not only look at the, the various families in this region, but you're also looking at who the wealthiest people are across every continent, no matter yes. where you live in the world you're gonna know who the richest person is there. What can we expect from that list? Um, I mean, one, it, it's not actually every continent, to be fair, there's seven, um, but we leave out Antarctica. We don't have that data. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we also look at Australia, which, you know, the continent is Oceania, but we look at Australia. Um, I mean, it's just a really interesting, you know, little snap, snippet of, of who the richest people are. I mean, it includes Ambani, who's obviously just spent about 150 million on a pre-wedding party for the his wedding? son. Well, we haven't even had it yet. No, it's like the pre-wedding party of yeah, the century. So what is that wedding going to be like? I can't wait to see. Um, there is actually one woman. Hooray! Uh, <laughs> that, uh, that's uh, Gina, who's... Um, the richest person in Australia. Yeah, Gina Reinhardt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. she's quite a well-known name. It's so interesting because one of my favorite stories from this month's edition is all about George Hbeya, mm -hmm. one of the most storied and most extraordinary and uh, popular haute couture houses in the world, uh, doing amazing things. And it seems to be down to his son, Jad Hbeya, who is bringing this incredible dynamism and the youth Mm -hmm. energy that he is bringing to the designs of the fashion house and really taking it to a whole new generation. I think this is a really nice example of how um, new generations come in and actually can rejuvenate and make something uh, continuously appealing to, to people from their own generation, not just the ones above them. Um, so Jab was actually on our 30 under 30 list. Exactly. Um, and, and yeah, it, as you say, he's bringing in, he's continuing to bring in the Arabic heritage to the designs, but in a way that's appealing to, to his very young, 
<laughs> young peers, um, but also new generations as they come up. So yeah, it's a really it's a really interesting story about how he's doing that. It's a fantastic exclusive interview. Of course, you know, addressing the likes of Beyonce, J Lo, mm -hmm. you know, you name it. The biggest names of the world have worn their dresses, which is incredible. That is in there to read. There is so much to explore in the March 2024 edition yes, yes. of Forbes Middle East. Grab your copy. I know. It's <laughs> available right now in print and online. Claudine, thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Sally. Thank you.